properly install Faxat as well as the Faxat plugins for Excel, PowerPoint and Word on your computer, you need a Faxat account, Microsoft Excel, at least for the Excel plugin, a semi-decent computer, so I would recommend at least 4 gigabytes of RAM at the bare minimum, and you need 2 gigabytes of unused space because the program needs to install itself, and in the final version it's about 1.3 gigabytes. Once you have all of these components, you simply open your internet browser, whether it's Google Chrome or Internet Explorer, it doesn't really matter, and you type in Faxet Software. Once you've entered Faxet Software, you, you go to the purple link below, which states Support Downloads. Once you are on the Faxet website, you go to the application slide on the right side of your screen. Here you click Faxet General Releases and you click the first item that pops up, which is the most recent and stably supported fax set for your Windows. If you have an iOS or an Android system, use either the fax set iOS or the fax set Android button. I would not recommend using this on an Android or on a phone. The software is usually way too heavy if you want to compile larger amounts of data, so I would recommend using it either on a Windows or on an iOS system. I would also not recommend installing an early adopter as these systems are usually full of bugs. It's better to wait a while if you're not that experienced or in desperate need of data and just download the general release. Once you've opened the general release tab, please click the download button given in blue near the 64-bit MSI 332 megabytes. This will give you the install file as given in the left corner of the screen and wait until this file has been downloaded. Once it has been downloaded, open the file and execute it. Once you are in the installer system, simply click next for the first slide. If you are on the private computer, which is not a work computer or something linked to a larger system, click the recommended Faxet install for all users. If this is not the case and you are either on a work server or for any other purpose need multiple accounts on your computer, click the only for me version of Faxet. In general, I would recommend installing it for the whole computer as this does not cause any issues with administrative rights. In this step, you can choose where you want to install your Faxet installation software. It's usually best if you have multiple drives on your computer to pick the fastest one to put the software at. So if you have an HDD and an SDD, put this fax set on your SDD because, that insta because the installation as well as the functioning of the program will be significantly faster. Usually the proper default function is already set, but you can change it by clicking the browse button. I would recommend in almost any instance to use the fastest drive that you have where you have at least say two gigabytes left. That's a bare minimum because otherwise you can't really run or install the program. When selecting the right location for your Faxet installation, you need to install the Faxet program. Simply click the install button and wait for about five to 10 minutes. It can be sooner or later, depending on your computer speed. Now, after the installation is finished, you click launch Faxet in the button or you simply search for Faxet near your programs and devices and then you open Faxet as I've done here. Now you need to click here on allow access at least twice to give Faxet access to your Microsoft firewall. This is needed as Faxet needs to upload information from the internet. After you've allowed Faxet access to your Microsoft firewall, two things can happen. In here, I have already installed my Faxet account. So if you have already installed your Faxet account, you'll just be shown a usual version of Faxet where you can do all the things you would like to. If you have not yet installed or logged in with your Faxet account for the first time, you need to log into this account. You get a very small pop-up in the center of the screen and it tells you to enter your Faxet username as well as password. It could be that it only asks you for your Faxet username and not your password. 
After this, you get another pop-up screen. This pop-up screen tells you to enter a certain verification code. This verification code will be sent to your email address, if you are from the Open University, your Gmail address where you requested your FactSet account. So an email will be sent to your email address. You need to open it and then put in the code. It contains six digits. So don't be stressed if when you enter your credentials, you don't enter the software. You first need to go to your email and plug in the proper identification code. Once you've logged into the software and everything works out fine, you can here see the main screen of today. This basic screen tells you what the financial markets are doing, what's happening to the crude oil price, to the stock market indexes or futures or whatever proxy they're going to use. So now once you've logged into FactSet and you have installed FactSet and you have a username, you can actually start using it. How to use it will discuss in the upcoming videos. But for now, I want to stress that after entering your credentials, I would recommend that you restart your computer because after restarting the computer, the FactSet software will be more properly integrated. When I first opened FactSet without restarting it, the stock indexes, as you can see here, were all blank. But after installing, after restarting the computer, there are currently actually figures shown in the graph. So you need to first restart your computer and also close the Excel and Microsoft and basically anything from Microsoft before you install the fact set. FactSet website, you see the following screen after you log in. To get here, you simply click on the website, you click on login, and then you enter your credentials and enter your verification code. So once in FactSet, you click this button and it shows you the screening tab. Now, all of these things are very, very useful, but to get large amounts of data simultaneously, you need to go to screening. So that's the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to collect large amounts of information simultaneously. So from multiple bonds over multiple countries, from multiple, etc. So a large scale of firms or bonds or equities or anything like that together. Now you need two things for this. For the static information, you need to go to the screening tab, which we're currently at. But for the market information, but for the time series information, so not just something which is the same for the firm at any point in time, like the country or the industry, but something which fluctuates over time, like the market cap or total assets or something like that. You need to use another item. For this, you need to use the Excel plugin, but we'll get to that in the next video. So in this video, we get the identifiers, and some static information for all the firms. And we need those identifiers to use the FactSet Excel plugin. Let's start off with a basic equity screen. Here you see a lot of items, but they are all very specific. So if you just want annual reports or something like that, or the information which is on annual reports for firms, you simply click the start of screen. This will open you the basic page with only the SP500 firms on it. <clears throat> The screen consists of two parts. The first part is the selection of all the firms that you want. And the second part below is the actual items that you want. Now you actually see here closing price, market value and sales, which are all time series variables. But this screening method kind of only allows you to get the most recent version of this. So at the most recent time period. So this will be probably be the market value today or market value end yesterday. And the thing that you need to consider here is that you can add previous dates, but they're usually inaccurate as far as I know. So I would not recommend if you need a time series of say 20 years to put in one of this variable for every year, because I don't think the data will be as accurate as it will be in the Excel plugin. So I would not recommend using that. Let's first go to the upper part of this. Here you can remove criteria that you don't want. So say I don't just want S&P 500 firms, I just remove this row. 
And now I get all the firms in their universe. We previously had 500 firms, and now we have one point, well, basically over 100,000 firms. But this may be a bit too much, so maybe you don't want all firms. Now, how do you make the selection? Either you can search something in here, so say I want only financials. Hey, here are some individual funds or some geography or some specific industry. But this is not as neat as you would have wanted it. So for individual items or specific, very specific items, go here. But it's easiest to click this button. This button allows you to very quickly search what you need. So this is an index if the fund is part of a certain index or a certain region. But this also may be very specific. So if you want to have all US firms, which are non-financial, for example, for some corporate analysis, um, you do it this way. So you don't go selecting on a specific index, but you go to the industry and then you say, hey, well, for my facts at industry, or you can use the SIG code if you want, it's, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I want all of it, but I don't want the financials. So maybe we do need to go to the SIG code and I say you have a primary SIG code and I want to add all of them, but not some financial index. Or maybe I don't want to have the public finance or the uh, justice department or something like that, or private households. Also don't like that. So say I want to add all of these industries. You simply select them and then you add add. Now what it does is it gives you all of the firms which are in these industries. So if you now also want a private household, it's not in here or the public and justice and safety department or something like that. So this selects the firms within a certain category. So we went from 152,000 to 88,000. So it's already quite a reduced number. You can see it here, it's a bit shady. I'll remove this so you can see it more clearly. So here you have selected already some of your, some of your firms on industry. Now we can go a step deeper. Say I want only North American firms, just to be very original. Um, I'm gonna add only North America, United States. Here are all the states, but say we don't care which state it is, I just want North America and only the United States because they have usually the most actively available data. There are some people who can argue about this, but usually the United States has the most accurate, up-to-date information, at least the, most, the largest quantity. So now we have 22,000 observations left. This amount is actually workable with an Excel plugin, but still it will take us a long time to do so. So we're going to refine it a little bit more. Say we need not only an exchange, but we have geography, say we want a security, and we only want a primary, uh, the ordinary share. So not the preferred equity or the preferred stock, or I think this is kind of the same, but at least we just want the ordinary shares. So we don't get any other stuff, no funds, no derivatives, no other items, just the ordinary shares. We add that as well. Now it's updating again, and we go to the lesser amount of firms. Now, this database tab is kind of useful because some of you may also have access to WRDS. And it's simply a lot easier to get your information from WRDS as it is from FactSet. Because you can just literally download the whole data set in a matter of seconds and it doesn't cost you any sort of time. So what you could decide is that I want to go for my financials and then I can click the other two databases but not CompuSat. Because CompuSat is also on WRDS. So that's a choice that you can make if you want to and if you have access to WRDS. If you don't, you can just select whichever thing you want. So say we now only want CompuStat because we already have the other two or we just want to link the identifiers or something like that. So now we add CompuStat to the mix and the item will go down, I think only marginally because a lot of US firms are in CompuStat. So if we would have picked this one instead of the other one, we would lose a lot of firms. If you want to have specific firms in there as well, like just I want Apple or something, uh, let's see if it finds it. Okay, App Apple, then I could add Apple to it but I'm not certain whether this is inclusive or it adds Apple as well. So we should not add Apple here. Let's just remove Apple. So, so for all of the firms in here, none of them were in CompuStat. So we should also add those two, or maybe we should just remove that one, but let's just add all of them and see what happens. And once we add the fact set fundamentals and the HSBC, we probably get a lot more firms. So you can be too selective in what you pick for and therefore there are no firms left. So make sure that you stay as general as possible when you can. 
You can add specific identifiers. You can add specific brokers. I would not go into this, by the way. Um, this is some other identification search. And here you can add specific variables. I want I want it only if it has a price larger than something, or if it has a price in the, in the first place. So here we have our selection. We want some sort of firms from specific industry in North America, which are in these three databases. Can, can happen. Sure, it works. So we have all of this, and now we have all of our firms, all of the firms here below. You see here a couple of 20,000 firms. We have the name, the stock exchange, some economy codes, closing price, market value, and sales. The clue here is to add the firms that have static information. So this, everything in here must be static, otherwise it's not that useful. There are a couple of exceptions, and we'll go to that in the end. But you, start, you should start with static information. So what's the easiest thing? Here you add variables for static information. So this is a whole list, but you need to th need to find things that don't change. So a QSIP is an identification code. It's usually for North American firms, and we have only North American firms, so a QSIP should cover a lot of the information. So we want to add a specific variable, in this case, a QSIP to identify. You need those identifiers if you want to link this to other databases or want to add bonds or something like that. So you need identifiers. You need them. Just put all of the ones that you can find in there because they don't always overlap as nicely as you want. So here in the search tab, you can click identifier, entity identifier or security identifier, find something. And here you have the default faction symbol or any, any other items. So if you want to find an ISIN, you're probably not going to find it in this list. You need to find security identifier and then in the top down menu, click an ISIN. Now, ISINs are very broadly used, and I would always recommend putting them in your dataset if you have them. Now, FactSet has CDLs, QSIPs, and ISINs, but not all of them are complete. That means that some firms have a CDL, some firms have a QSIP, and some firms have an ISIN, but they pr usually don't have all of them. However, they do have tickers, the FactSet symbol, or the ticker symbol, or however you want to call it. So a local ticker, a regional ticker, put all of those tickers in there as well because you are going to need them. You can use the tickers to link to other databases, Bloomberg, WRDS, whatever you have in mind. So you need to have those identifiers in there. Okay, so here we find ourselves, this is some sort of uh, local ticker. We have a QSIP, we have an ISIN, assume that we also have the actual ticker. So, and the symbol also works as a ticker. So we have a lot of information here already. So now we can find the firm and identify them. That's very, very important because you need it for the Excel plugin as well as for any sort of data analysis. Now let's add some other variables. <coughs> we have financials. That's probably the worst thing to search for because they are usually quite fluctuating over time. Reference data, that already makes it a little bit nicer. So say we want to have ourselves um, a country, we want to know where the company is from. Location is always fixed. At least we assume that it's usually fixed. Uh, so, country. Can shares, country, region, price of primary exchange. Name default. So you can just put the, either a code or a name. Let's now just put a name in. So then you get the country of the firm. That's the static. That's nice to have. It's, it's good. Uh, shares outstanding is not a variable that you want because it varies over time because people can add more shares or something like that so you can just go through this whole list and add everything that you could possibly want but there are some additional tricks so you have the industry the country the identifiers most of them are static but there are some tricks to save you up a lot of work once you go to the excel plugin that is just download the variables that you actually want in here and like five or ten years ago or something like that so that you know whether there's information on because not every firm might have for example ESG information so here I had the ESG country something country code or ESG value or uh, let's see if we can find MIS MICS global ESG ratings so it's research rating scores. I just add this thing for environmental or I don't care. You can add a lot of things here, but let's just assume they don't want this one in last month, which is the most recent period, basically. Now I can say, okay, add me that one. And 
if fax had has information on this, it will show up in this variable. So you can't use it to, to actually use the variable, but you can use it to select which variables you need information on. So I know that for this MCIS ESG score, there are about 2,000 firms in the database that have information, not 20,000. So if you would need to run all 20,000 in the Excel plugin, it would take you a lot longer period of time because it's quite time consuming to do that. So this is an easy way to save you up a lot of time. Now say that we also want to have it from say like 2004 on uh, December 1st, just pick something. And I want to add that as well. Now this doesn't work perfectly, so you can't do it for like every time that you want that you want it in your observation. But let's just see what happens if we do this. So we have this ESG score, and there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, a lot of nothing. But maybe once we come across a firm, we see that there's information here, but not there. So it could be that the firm defaulted or got merged before 2020, or that it just like it, it could not exist anymore. So therefore, if you add one or two previous dates, or three or five, however many you want, you could make a very quick selection. Hey, does this firm exist? Does this firm work? ESG scores are only available as of 2006 in this database, I believe. So if you add like 2014 and 8 or something, then it's, it's, it's likely that if there's ESG information, it will be available in at least one of those three cases. So you can simply say, for the firms that I want ESG information on, drop them if there's nothing in these ESG variables. So that goes, saves you, ah, look, here's something, but it's the same here. So it's quite autocorrelated over time, but there's information on it. And here it's only in 2014, but not in 2020, which means that if you would just put in 2020, you would drop this firm, but there is information on it. So you kind of need this. So you need to have multiple of those variables so you can quickly screen which variables have ESG information in the first place. Now you can do the same for, for example, total assets to find out whether a firm has accounting information. I suppose that most do, but it's, it's not all of them, actually, surprisingly enough. Um, and you need to add as well some market variables, such as like uh, market cap or something, just something very, very easy. Market cap, company level, latest compound periods, and then a couple of other items as well. So you can make sure that you have some sort of market variable indicator. Now you have your industry, you have your market variable, you have your accounting variable, you have your special research variable, where you, what you want to do research about. So for example, ESG scores, but it could as well be uh, the book to market ratio or uh, some accounting variable that you find very interesting or something like that. So check on all of those variables and then select the firms which actually have them. You should not delete the firms without your specific research variable because you can use the other firms as a benchmark. But this, this is what I would do. So here the firms don't have any market value. But wait, this is a bit strange. None of them have market value today. So either all of them defaulted, which is kind of unlikely, or we have a wrong variable. In this case, we probably have a wrong variable. So if you find something very strange, I would recommend adding multiple variables, which kind of measure the same thing, because they all have different origins. This one is from Fraxet Corporate Actions. This is from Fraxet Estimates. The estimates are already less available than corporate actions. Reference data is usually quite available. Fraxet Global, but for some items we might not even have access to. So Switzerland volume daily. I don't, I don't know if you have access to this data bit. So let's just add it in and see if it gives you an error. Because sometimes you can't access a certain database and then it gives you an error and you cannot add the variable. This is because we simply don't have the license. Some of them are very expensive, like market or something like that. So just add a couple of variables, which are quite similar. So this one is absolutely non-related, but to prove a point that some variables are not in the data set, like price or market value company, something like that. Just add some items to see whether there's differences across them. Because if an item is from a different data set, in fact set, it can be different than on another variable, whilst it seems highly similar. So let's move over here. Okay, none of them have closing prices, market value, market value. Well, the Swiss volume daily is of course a fluke. So if you don't want them anymore, click here. Click delete, now it's gone. Very easy. This thing we have in there twice, so we delete that one as well. Ah, here we see some market price. This one has no market price, this one has uh, is ESG actually. So it has a closing price, but it's not going to market value. So sometimes you need to compute this yourself. 
If you know that closing price is more actively available than market value, also pick the shares outstanding and multiply them to get the market value. You need to be a little bit agile with this. So you see here, oh, there's actually the market value, but this one's not the market value. So two variables which seemingly do the same. One of them has information, the other one has not. So delete the ones that you don't need. Here you have your identifier. This firm has all of the identifiers, but often it's not the case. So you only have one of them. But as these are US firms, the data is quite readily available. What does it mean if your firm has no closing price here? It means that the firm nowadays is not listed anymore. That could be because it defaulted, because there are mergers, or maybe there are some other strange reasons why there's no closing price. Maybe the market was just closed yesterday or something like that. But if this thing picks the latest available period, then it's probably that the firm is not listed anymore. So you can say, okay, I don't need the firm. That's perfectly possible. You just put it in your statistical software and you drop it if the value is a, a dash or a zero or not available or something like that and then you are have removed those firms. But it could be that a year ago or a month ago, the firm did still exist. So I personally want to have those in my data set as well, because otherwise you have a survivorship bias. Now we have all of this beautiful information and we want to actually use it. So for aesthetics, this is sufficient, I think. You have some sort of industry, you had, uh, I thought we had an industry somewhere. This is the exchange country name. We also, we had an industry, but we lost it. Let's find a new industry. Sick uh, codes, sick codes, entry data. Just put the sick codes in there. Sick codes, da, da, da. rank one. You can pick multiple levels, but just throw in some sick codes, see which one sticks. Then we have an industry, we have a name, we have a ticker symbol, we have some sort of identification what data is actually available in your data set. And then we have this whole data. So here there's some sick codes, beautiful. We know which industry the firm is in. We know what the name of the firm is, we know what the identifiers are. We know whether there was still data available. Now we want to save all this. All you need to do is simply click this button, download to Excel, and it saves your firm. You can also save it here to save the whole request if you want to edit it later. But now, for now, I don't need to. So I'll just Excel download this. Firm. This will take a while. Sometimes it glitches, so you need to Put the download button again, but that maybe because I had a have a very strict safe setting on this thing. So here it will start downloading the file, then we'll show here once it's completed. So now it does nothing, and now it downloads. It's only two megabytes, so three megabytes, it's very small. But once you go, if you would have not screened this or put the variables in here, it would have been substantially larger because it would have been 150,000 firms. And if they're not in the selection that you want, you should not add them in here because it will make the work in the Excel plugin astronomical. You really want to skim down as much as you can before you go into the Excel plugin. Let's quickly open up this file so you can sh um, look what it, I can show you what it looks like. It's already loading the Excel, Excel plugin. We're not going to use that right now, but we'll use it in our next session. So here we have enable editing the file that we just downloaded. We have all the information here. It shows a nice if it doesn't exist. And here's a ticker symbol, the name and everything is nice and beautifully in this file. Now we got the Excel in the following format. I removed the first three rows because they do not contain any information, but let's now complete our data set. So you already saved this in a different file. So for now, I just delete everything that I kind of don't really need. So let's just delete all of this information. And for multiple firms and multiple, I mean like really large amounts of firms. In this case, we have 22,000 observations, as you can see here. I recommend using one variable a page. If you have a lesser amount of firms, you can use multiple variables a page, but you need to rearrange the format. So now we will have the symbol on this axis and then the variable by every time step on that axis, on the x-axis. So 
let's start with a very basic variable total assets. We call it to, uh, total assets 2000. And let's just get it on a yearly basis to get the easiest possible thing. What you need to do is you need to click here at your FactSet tab. Now, if you don't yet have this FactSet tab, you need to install the FactSet software, FactSet app, this one, and you need to restart your computer. You need to restart it before the FactSet tab can actually work. If you have not yet logged in, you can launch FactSet to log in over here. So there are a couple of things that you can do. You can start with a pre-created list as we have here, or you can get a new list yourself. But keep in mind that this is not the way you should be using it. If you want one or two firms, that's fine. If you want 10 firms, still fine. But if you want more than say like 50 firms, I would use the screening tool. So let's first start with a very basic scenario in which we have no firms. Then we use the identifier lookup. This allows us to get us this code for every firm. We use click identifier lookup and we get the following screen. This screen allows you to screen for individual firms from a very large set of items. Here it shows you all the possible things that you can get, but we just want common stock. So we remove the ADRs, GDRs and any of the other items. We also only want primary listings and say active firms. You could also remove them, then you can have defaulted or merged firms, but let's just assume that this is sufficient selection for us. So here we want, for example, Apple or uh, IBM. So just put IBM in there, International Business Machines. Then we add the idea. Then we add uh, Apple. I hope I typed this correctly. Apple Inc, Apple US, that's the stock. Make sure that you pick the right ticker. If you already know where the stock is coming from, pick the right one. So usually the least complex name is the best one and in the region where the firm should be. So this is a Japan version. And uh, yeah, it's, it's probably a version of Apple, but then a different listed one or a different version. So I would pick the one in the country where you think is the right one. And usually the least complicated the name, the more action accurate is so this is golden apple oil and gas that's probably not the apple i had in mind and it's from the us it's a us sticker so that's probably the right apple so let's add micro micro soft there or just Alcro micro corp a small firm from taiwan i don't know really what it is um x let's see if it searches for a ticker as well this should be United States Steel Company, but you see it doesn't it actually does find it, but not at the first time. So entering the name of the firm is best, but if you don't, you can use it here, United States Steel Company SX. So you can also search a ticker symbol, but you need to make sure that you pick the right one. And then let's add uh, Boeing, because it's currently under fire. So let's add Boeing. Okay, we have now a couple of stocks in here. What you could also do, and we'll do that later on in the video, is add fixed income or any sort of other items. But let's start off with stocks or equities in this case, because it's just the easiest. Once you've added your list, you add add, and all of the items appear here. So we enter our formula, insert formula over here. The formula sidebar allows you to first select which identifiers you want, and then select the firm that you want. I'm going to do this uh, for in each firm individually because it's more elegant and easier to use if you know it this way. You can also select all the firms at once, but it goes only up to 25 firms. So if you have more than 25 firms, you cannot use it. So therefore, I use this tool, select identifier, and I only pick this individual item. So I say, give me as the firm I want to investigate this item, IBM US. And here I see a whole list of things that I might like, I might use. I've added this as a favorite myself because I'm into this field. But you see here a lot of stuff going on. Firstly, you just see prices, dates, market values, company names, so a lot of a lot of items. But this is very limited. There's a lot more. The first thing you need to take into account is that these are the preferred or recommended data items. I would say if you're using looking for basic stuff like total assets, balance sheet variables, market caps, click on this. So you only get the ones which FactSet recommends you to use. 
those usually contain the most accurate and best information. Some cases from a very weird data provider only have a small subset of all data points. So it's best to use these if you do not need something very special. Then you can click at sources and select the source which you want. But this may be a little bit unorthodox. So if you click here and you go to group by source, you see a lot of items. You see currently not too much because I haven't searched anything. But let's search for uh, assets. Assets. Now here we have a couple of items. And if we remove this, we have even more. Facts at fundamentals, facts at estimates, facts at ownership, facts at, facts at activism. All of these things contain a lot of information. The regulatory bank and financials, that's a bit of a strange database. It's also not too properly supported because there are no Fs here in fact set. So if we only say the ones which fact set recommends us to use, we get fundamentals, estimates, and ownership. Estimates are stuff which are calculated. I would not go into that. The earnings surprises and stuff like that. Ownership is who holds the firm, but that's also not really the total assets we're looking for. So for the most basic stuff, you go to fact set fundamentals. I would always recommend first going to the fact set fundamentals and then to everything else. So, facts at fundamentals, you open it and here you see a couple of items. You could also have done this by a list, it would probably provide you with the thing you need first, but not always. So, say we want a total assets. We click total assets and then the following screen opens. If it doesn't, simply right uh, left click it or right click it, either one of the two, and it opens. Here you have the reporting basis. This is a very weak point of fact set because if you click monthly and there's no monthly information, it will simply give a blank. So it will give 200, uh, like 240 blanks instead of 20 annual items. So it, it, it's not, if it's missing, I'll replace it with the annual variable. No, it's, if it's missing, it's missing. So you don't get anything. So let's now just go for annual. Here you can select the time frame. If you do it like this, they're all dashes over here. It means use one point in time. So I only want the latest complete period. It's now 2020, so that will be 2090 Q4. So December 2019, that's the last annual report. However, I can put the start date at a different point. So I can either select a date with this tool, like I did here, which is easy to do if you want multiple variables and have only a couple of firms, but for now I'll not be doing that. What you could also do is you can click the calendar button and you can click the time you need. So here you can go to next month. If you want to go quicker, you click this twice, and then you can select all number of years. Say we want all information since 2000, January 1st. And we want it not until the same point of time, but say we want it until the latest completed period. This will give us 20 years of observations. So this format looks a bit strange, but these are the total assets of IBM in millions given by this row. Now, this format is not too nice. I want to default, frequency default, we only set reporting basis annual, so just let's say yearly calendar. I want this and the yearly calendar is exactly the same thing, but make sure that you do this right. Currency, we could say local, but that would be strange as we also have this Taiwanese firm in there. So I want the currency to be US dollar. It's best for a data set to have the same currency everywhere because you don't need to convert everything by exchanges and stuff like that. And that simply doesn't cloud your time series. Accounting basis, consolidated. This means that it has been checked by an accountancy bureau and it's okay, it's usually quite accurate to use. And at least someone looks at it without the company just publishing it, whatever it wants. So that's a good thing to do. Uh, the other stuff I would just leave as B. So default is probably millions, but let's just keep it as it is. Now, if you want to change the order of this thing, uh, well, before we do that, we click here at definition. This shows you what the thing actually is. So it is total assets, it's units in millions, and we have usually annual information for all industries. So this is simply total assets in millions for that specific firm because we selected here IBM. Now, here's the formula itself, but you kind of don't really need this. You can just leave this unclocked, you don't need to use this. If you click at this item next to the insert button, you can change a lot of stuff. Say I want you to go horizontal, I have all my items like this. I would recommend doing it like this because if you have multiple firms and you don't do it like this and you put just total assets in front, you have a two-dimensional uh, thing going on. If you do it like this, you need to 
put the firm names over there and then the variable name over there. But I personally like this setup more. So you go to horizontal. Now what you could do is you could add the company names in there, but it gives you the company name and then something already there. But we already have the company name as we found it in the previous tab. So that's not by definition necessary. Item description. Well, we, we know what total assets is, so we also don't really need to do that. But it could be useful to add the dates in there. So now you get the dates and then the company information. And the beauty of this is, is that you only need to do this once because you use the same interval for every firm. And if that firm already exists at the starting point and still exists at the end point, so you need to pick a firm that survived all the time series, you can use this. However, now you see that slightly moved. So if we want to add dates just for this item, I'd say we use dates and then we put it actually here. And here we do exactly the same the same thing. So we add the total assets and now we get the dates variable the first row and then, oh, sorry guys. And then we add the right variable in there. Once you have selected everything you want, this goes until, uh, this goes until 220. So I insert it now. Now it gives me all that I need. And once it's green, it can still move. Once it's white, it's already pasted. And it pastes into an array. So you cannot easily change this. If you need to change something, click at it, adjust whatever you want, and click Control Shift Enter. That's the only way you can do this. Or press Escape if you want to get out. If you don't do this, you get something like this. So I say plus 12, which doesn't really make sense, but plus 10, you can't change any part of an array. Cancel. So it simply doesn't allow this. Now that you have your first variable in the row, you do a similar thing. You add total assets, you do the same thing, but now you get the date twice. And you don't really want that because it obscures the order of your variables. So you remove the date and now it's in the right format. And hey, it's still RBM. That's not correct. So let's just look at this one. I add Apple US and then you see that Apple grew significantly faster than RBM did. And you insert it. Now you could do this for every variable, but that would be very time consuming. What you could also do is, I want to have this for this range of variables. This only works for small amounts of variables. Now you have three variables. I again want the total assets. And if I'm correct, yes, it should show me everything like this. So I insert the whole thing. And now we have our variables that we wanted. Why do you think that these digits are so very strong? Well, we need converted this to US dollars. So probably it's a large currency and then you trans translate it. And then because of the FX rate, which is not that precise, you don't get any rounded numbers. But it's also relatively small in comparison to the others. Although these are pretty massive firms. So you have this firm, a couple of firms. You have the information. You know how to get the date. You know how to get it for an individual firm without date and for a score of firms. Now I'll teach you how to do it for multiple firms with over the 25 limit, because this array is limited to 25 firms. So we now do the same. I remove all of this. I pick one variable, give me this firm, I don't even know what it is. Um, I give me total assets in the same array, so it remembers what you actually did, if I'm correct. So inputs, the same stuff, 2010, Yearly basis, input completed. Okay, so there's no information here. Only, oh, this is no information here. So we know this is 2020. I could have put the date in, but it would have ended up in exactly the same thing. So I say here, total assets. I say there, give me dates as well. So now you have your dates in there. It gives me a red screen because I overwrite the previous code. You need to click overwrite existing data and only then it will give you the existing data. So. This firm, not the best example because it doesn't live anymore or it doesn't, didn't live or just it's an inactive firm. But what you could do is if you add a firm in here temporarily without a date because it makes my life a bit easier, I remove the date, I insert it, still little information but the code is all right. You can look at this. This is the fact set code to upload the information. Fact sets, um, give me this variable, yearly, use dollars, annual frequency, uh, and from this date onwards. And this is total assets. You cannot really play around with this code too much because sometimes the order or the items in here change. 
So you can't just put FF uh, liabilities or something like that. I mean, that might, might work, but if you go for market cap, then it breaks down. So you should just use the second slide bar every single time that you want to use something. Now, after doing clicking it, you can copy the code and then press escape to leave it. Here, you can re-enter the code. Now it is without the array, so you can actually edit it and say, I want here number four. Then I press enter. Now it gives me this calc sign, which means it still needs to be calculated, but it's still editable. So before you make this calculation, you click it down to everything. This will take a considerable amount of time. I'm here recording this on a gaming laptop with a pretty good CPU, and it's still taking an amount of time. You should not click anything whilst doing this, because I'm pretty sure your computer will crash. You need to have a strong computer to do this for many firms at once. So don't use a, 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 a very basic laptop. You need to have something more powerful, especially with multiple cores or just at least very strong cores, a good SSD drive. I would not recommend using doing this for many firms at a small computer. For a small amount of firms, it's quite fine. Now everything has been put into place. I'd recommend you save the file. File, save as, uh, put it in downloads or something. So I just call this junk file because I don't need it myself, but at least I saved it. So always save it before you start doing this. And then you can select a number of firms. Say I select myself those 24 firms. I go to fact set, refresh in selection. Make sure that you don't click refresh the, the, the usual button because it refreshes everything and that will just crash your computer. So pick a small number of firms and click refresh in selection. Now what this does is it opens fact set, you get the screen and it puts everything in there. Now this was pretty fast, so you actually see that some firms have nothing, some firms have some information, it just depends a bit. But the strange thing happens is when you pick too many firms. So this was 24 firms, that's quite doable. But in this list, there are 22,000 firms. If you were to do all of them at once, your computer will crash independent of how good your computer is. That is because this software uses Excel. And Excel is horribly built for large amounts of data. It simply can't handle it. So Excel has a limit of a million observations this way. So if you would want annual observations of this series, you would have 22,000 firms over 20 years. Say you want annual over 20 years. You would have 440,000 observations. That, that's like almost half what Excel can handle. That's quite a lot. But if you want, say, monthly returns, stock returns, you couldn't even do it because you run over the Excel limit. So it's therefore I recommend using one variable, a slide, uh, or, or a sheet, actually. So I would recommend, if you have a really good computer, to use about at most a thousand at once. It will take a long time, and it takes almost exponentially longer to run that. So now I have like 100 and... 37 firms or something like that. I select them. I could oh, actually I calculate this correctly. Nice. And then it goes still quite swiftly. But if you use a thousand, it takes exponentially longer. So say I use myself a thousand firms or even 1500, then it, it, it's really about the maximum this PC can handle. And it got eight cores. It's a really good PC. So you see it loads and it's now surprisingly fast, but usually it takes a lot longer. And now it just, you'll see the screen for many, many minutes. Then it will say resizing arrays, and then you'll see here what the percentage is, but it's not even there. So this may take up to five minutes or something like that to run. And if you cancel it, you'll probably crash the whole program and lose your data. So between every retrieval, save your data. That's the one thing I need to tell you. Save it, save it, save it, because that's the way to preserve your data. I would even recommend to save it under a different name because then you get less errors somehow. Now it's got past 100% and now it's adding everything, resizing arrays. And now you will see here in the bottom near my arrow, in the bottom of the screen, you will see how fast it's going, but it's still not even basing in all the arrays. So this can take a while. If you have 20,000 firms and you need to do this every time, it takes a long while, it's still running, it's still running, it crashes 20 times in between then I'd recommend you first use your statistical software to delete the firms that you kind of don't want in here. Now I'm saving it and 50-50 it will crash. Okay, I got lucky it didn't crash, but that happens quite often. So you need to save this in between 
and it will be best to just remove the firms that don't have any observations. So I don't know what they are, but they don't have observations in this time sit, at least until, so, until this far. So it's best to just remove them preemptively so that you don't have them in your data set. I mean, if there are no total assets available, just drop the firm, I would say. Also, these firms, they don't have anything, they can go away, so firm, firm away. So clean them first so you have less observations and then do the screening. You can have many additional variables. So we again copy a list of firms. Let's just copy some of them over here. I'll make a new sheet. I added everything in there. And then we find for some other useful stuff. So make sure that you select a firm and then search for firm items. You should not select a firm and a bond or something like that because you have different items. I mean, the bond doesn't have any total assets, but a firm does. So sometimes it shows, sometimes it doesn't. You don't get the right variables. Just pick one item. So not an index and a firm, not a firm and a bond, not an index and a bond. Just pick one category of financial instruments. Now, say I want not my total assets, but I want some sort of more difficult to find things. I want an ESG rating. Ah, there's nothing really ESG. So this doesn't somehow work. I remove this recommended item. And hey, I see some ESG. So here's ESG MCS fundamental. Funds, metrics, ESG score, just put in an ESG score. It's probably for one item. So you have a lot of items in here and all of them you can use. Now just click them down, you refresh and selection, and then it takes a couple of seconds and you find that there's no information. It's quite likely because a lot of firms don't have this information. But you can just find basically anything that you want by typing it in here. So uh, market cap, hey, I have this very much information from all strange sort of indexes. I mean, Turkey's Istanbul Stock Exchange is probably not my go-to thing for US stocks. So I click this one again, and it gives me all of these items. So facts at fundamentals or prices I would pick. Prices, market, level, company level. Just insert the thing. There are no market caps here. Again, these are just randomly picked firms, and there's a lot of junk in the data set as well. You need to clean that before you do this. But for the time being, you have nothing. That's very friendly. So it's just there's no market cap at this point of time for these firms. But you can, with this way, find all sorts of information. Now, you can also get information on bonds and other items in here. So let's look the identifier lookup to just find some random bonds I want to analyze. I have this bond. Here you have the equity tables, but you also have ETFs. Uh, you have futures, you have holder information, mutual funds, options, a lot of stuff. But let's go for fixed income. I want to go for corporates, and I have actively primates, I just the primary, and there I click my Apple bond. Apple Inc. Um, this one is to 2050, which I think looks quite funny. But let's just add in a couple of bonds and all of them from Apple. So I add all of them in there. You see, those are probably the same bonds, but they're the same ticket symbol, but a different exchange ticker. So be careful that you pick the ones that you actually want on the right exchange, etc., etc. I add those in there, and then hopefully they'll show up in here. Add in, add in. Okay, so sometimes if you, if you select too many, this, this thing crashes. Let's now go to less than 50, add in. Also doesn't work. So we have no bonds. Sometimes the thing crashes. So again, to equities, no equities, fixed income, corporate, uh, IBM, big IBM, Blanco, IBM, uh, I have, or we can go Ford, Ford 2030, I'll add that thing in there, and I'll move here. I click OK, this was the thing I didn't do last time, so you add them, then you click OK, then there is a bond ticker in here. Now you again go to the formula, you remove the item, you add the thing in here. You could also search here for Ford, but it's easier because now you know that you have a bond. But if you search for market cap, you're going to go search for a market cap on a bond, and that's not really accurate. So say I want to have the duration of the bond on this thing and then I have a lot of durations. So this could be the duration of the bond. And now this bond didn't exist then, but maybe it runs until fee. So say I insert this, I get myself the duration of the bond. 
So this item has apparently no information, but you should just click and find the one until you actually get it. So you can here select your bonds and you can select different information for different items. So this one should have duration information. If I go back to here and I again copy my Boeing item and I say uh, give me uh, give me again Boeing please and um, delete this and give me duration or something it, 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 it doesn't do anything. So if you add multiple items in there, it doesn't work out the way you, sh you want it to. So you can here search for indexes, for bonds, for equities, but you should put them separately because they're not the same thing. I would recommend if you use a number of items that is as large as 20,000, use one sheet, an Excel file. So you should have multiple Excel files because otherwise it crashes. If you fill up this whole thing with information, the, the, the size of the file will get so large that Excel can't handle it anymore. It's very unfortunate, but that's the limitation that you have when using Excel. So I would not recommend using multiple items like I did here on one sheet. It's just for illustration purposes, but use one item like total assets, total liabilities, total debt, whatever, uh, per screen. And this is the basics that I wanted to tell you, talk to you about. So now you know how to get your statics, now you know how to get the time series information. You can simply merge the two on this code. That's the beauty of having this code in there because it links to your these variables and to your statics. So the time series and the static variables, you can link them via this variable or via the name, but you need to get lucky on this. So best is just to use these. And once you have the proper variable, then you look for it. Here you also see some errors in here. So make sure that you remove the duplicates. Those terms look the same. They are not the same, but they have the same code, so make sure that you have also an ISIN that you can compare to if they're duplicates and stuff like that. So make sure that you don't mess up uh, any of the calculations over here. Um, this is the most important thing that I wanted to teach you about FactSet. So now you know for large databases how to get your statics, your identifiers, industry variables, country. It's very easy, you just export them on the file. You don't need to do this for all of your firms over the time series. And you know how to get your accounting, your markets, variables, and your basically anything else you would possibly need from FactSet. So this is the way to do it for larger sample sets. If you want to go for individual items, you could probably just go to the FactSet server here. I hope I'm still logged in. Let's take, let get this to take a second. So commodities and securities, and then you can just search whatever. I want to have Apple. Apple Inc. and then I get the information for Apple. So this is for one individual variable, one individual firm in this case, but it might be a lot easier if you would do this for other items. So Apple increased in price absolutely insanely much. But the thing is that um, you could use this for individual variables, but doing this for all of them in every single period of time, you would go nuts. It would just take too much time. So therefore you need the screening over here and the Excel combination. Thank you all for listening.